Okay, so have a look at this slide uh, when you get a chance uh, on your own. And if you haven't watched the bird video, watch it because it kind of explains this. And what it does is it's kind of cool. It takes it from the perspective of COVID. And for example, well, I, in here they talk about COVID in the workplace, but uh, you can apply it to anything, all right? And um, it's interesting because it looks like it, it takes a look at the personalities and how they interact with, with the COVID-19 situation, not just the virus itself, but everything that went with it, right? Um, it's been a few years already, but you remember the COVID situation. There was a lot of different rules that we didn't have today, that we don't have today, you know, that six foot social thing. Um, they took out half the chairs in the classrooms because you couldn't sit as close as these chairs were. Um, when we finally came back, we, we were not back for a long time, but when we finally came back, we, 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 the class capped, I think, at 10, 12, something like that, and attendance plunged. Obviously, people didn't want to leave the house. Online attendance went way up, obviously, but now it's reversed, and we're, we're quite back to normal now. Anymore. Our enrollment's almost 12,000, so we're, we're right back. But have a look at the video if you haven't seen it. The main link is in the announcements, like everything else. Okay, and when you're looking at it, you might want to pop open that elements of character thing that I just had up, and look at the traditional labels: the stable, the unstable, and you can make the association. So that is the one part of that is the one part of our character module. Okay. The other part, of course, was the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for those of you who have chosen Maslow to write about, it's very rich. You get a lot of stuff out. You can't pay attention to the video that we need to talk about. It. You can get a lot out of it. Talking about motivation and what makes characters do what they do. That, that whole piety with conflict where they interact, but once they interact, it's important to know why. Why do they interact and react like they do? And that's what Maslow does. So these are the four things that we've looked at so far, we're about to look at, okay? Um, in terms of our points of analysis. So for this for the second essay cycle, okay, once again, you get to choose the points of analysis that you use. You also get to choose the story. The only codicil to this is that it has to be a different one from the first one. So in other words, you can't use the same story. I had somebody ask me, I don't know if they were from here or not, whether they could continue the evaluation with a different point of analysis. And I thought that was a good idea, but we're not geared for that, okay? I may switch that up later and make it that way, using one story and three points of analysis, four. But for now, I want you to choose a separate point of analysis. Separate story, separate point. Whichever one you choose is up to you, as long as you don't duplicate your efforts, okay? Any questions? No, you just came, you can't ask a question. I already answered. What? Like what? Different character? No, like different, because uh, I'm doing um, That's got to be separate. In, in other words, you can't use like conflict, or you can't use one element of the plot for the first one and a different element for the second. So the plot is going to be separate. The idea is exposure, guys. I want you to be exposed to as many different of these as we can in a short time. A little taste, per se. You're not eating a meal, we're just having a taste. So anyway, as I was saying, these are the four points of analysis that we've covered so far that your choice, you can choose for cycle two. For cycle two, guys, we're not doing, um, we're not doing point of view, we're not doing symbolism, and things like that. That's cycle three. Right? So if you've started doing that, that's not cycle two. Now you can keep it for cycle three, but change it to one of these four cycle two. Right? 
Cycle one, we did two. Now cycle two, we're expanding to four, and cycle three, we go to six. So it's more choices as we go. So for the first point of analysis, of course, we have the elements of the clock, which include exposition, rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the resolution combined called the deep data model. Um, that was one point of analysis. So plot is the point of analysis. In other words, you can't do exposition for your first essay and then rising action for your second one. It's all plot. Okay. Our second point of analysis was conflict. Okay. Man versus self, man versus man, man versus society, man versus nature. Again, if you did one of these, you have to do something completely different for the second one. Okay. The third one, notice they get juicier as we go, right, in terms of what they are. The third one is character, and there were two parts to that. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which deals with the um, motivation of characters, the why, and it had five stages in the model that we looked at, right, the little model, the original model, I should say. The physical or the physiological, the safety, the social, the esteem, and the self-actualization. And then the second piece, we were just talking about that before, the personality traits, okay? And the traits are generally made up of the four areas, fame, color, phlegmatic, and melancholic, and they're a combination of, as I said, stable, unstable, right? Introvert, extrovert. You can look at the bird video to see a nice analogy to it and just glance at that chart that I had up earlier. The characterization for the sheet, that's a good chart. You don't have to you know, dig too deeply. If you look at it even passingly, you'll have a good idea. Remember, guys, this is all basically psychology, right? Human psychology, which means that the direct parallel. So you can, in fact, think people when you're looking, especially at this stuff, right? That's what it was made for. Right? But for our purposes, of course, it enables us to look at characters and stories and figure them out, right? which can be a key to understanding the whole story. That's the point, right? When we talk about analysis, that's our focus, guys, this semester. Our focus is to be able to read something, in this case it's a short story, and be able to get it right, right away. And you may be able to get it from the way it's laid out in the plot, you may be able to get it by the way the characters interact, you may be able to get it by who the characters are and what they're doing. You don't have to get it with all of them, right? Once you get it with one, it will unlock the whole thing, okay? and it'll fit. And this obviously doesn't just apply to short stories, this applies to life, okay? You're having a, a situation at a family dinner, somebody's acting a certain way, well, why? Is there a way to fix it? Depends on the motivation, it depends on like the Maslow. Is there anything going on in their life that could be you know, broken and affecting everything else? That kind of thing. So, real life applications for this as well, guys. Right? Now today, I want to look over the setting notes. And it seems like it's the smallest, but it is in terms of what it is. But it's not the least important of anything, okay? The setting, as it says there, is the time and location in which a story takes place, okay? Where and when. And that goes from micro to macro as well, guys. When we talk about time, we talk about the tense that the story is written in. Is it written in past tense? Is it written in present tense? Or is it written in future tense? Past tense would be was, were, right? I saw the tree. I saw the tree already. I see the tree, right? I'm looking at it right now in the present. I will see the tree. I will see it when I get there, the future. Okay. So 
So you're talking about point of view, perspective, tense, all right? Past, present, and future in terms of the story itself. Now, most fiction is written in past tense. Why? Why would a novel be written in past tense? Well, what is it? What's it what is a novel? What is it? Hmm? It's a story. And who's telling you the story? The writer, the author. Okay? So if someone is telling you a story, if I'm standing here telling you a story, what can you imply? It already happened. Because otherwise, how would I know? Right? I can't tell you a story if I don't know what happened. Now, we could be walking together and be taking part in a story. That's the I see the tree thing. Right. Now, if we're walking together and we're talking back and forth and I'm telling you a story and things are happening as we walk and whatnot, now we're in present tense, that's different. Okay. But most books, most fiction is written in past tense. And the reason is, of course, because the author already has to know what happened in order to tell that story. So most stuff is written in past tense. It's an example of one of the aspects of setting, okay? The tense of the story, okay? The location, where does the story take place, okay? Is it important? Some stories, the location really isn't important. It's just, you know, just the author just needs a place to set the characters. And it doesn't really affect anything. That whole idea in conflict, when we said, uh, what is conflict? It's a significant interaction, right? That advances the story. That last part advances the story. That's key. But you can take that and bring it right into setting. Okay. Does the setting affect the story? If yes, then how? If no, then move on. Okay. It's not, setting might not necessarily be a good point of analysis for you to choose if it's insignificant. Okay. What do we mean by, can somebody give me an example of how a story where the setting is significant? If it takes place. Say again? If it takes place in a certain. Give me an example. You're right, but give me an example. How about Jaws? Yeah. We've used Jaws. Can Jaws take place in the Arctic? Yes. Arctic? No. Wait. Arctic? No. <laughs> well, no. you can get really creative with it, maybe. Why not? Because there's, there's no beach factor. Exactly. There's, yeah, there's, there's no beach ice. factor, right? This is what, what I mean by significant, right? So Jaws needed that beach scene for a lot of things. But one of the main conflicts was man versus society where the chief wanted to close the beaches, remember? And the mayor wouldn't let them because they didn't want to lose the 4th of July business. Right? That's why they hired Quint. Remember Quint says, I'll put you all on a pay and basis so you don't have to be on welfare all winter. If it was in the Arctic, that wouldn't be a concern. It would be a different concern, right? Because there would be no beaches to close. So, yeah, in Jaws' case, the setting is significant, right? And you needed the water in the ocean because that's where sharks are. So that's an example of a significant setting. You could use that as a point of analysis. You could look at the setting, right? Prime, again, we've got the primary thing and then secondaries, right? So the primary setting of Jaws would be in the ocean on that boat in the last scene in the movie where they're hunting the shark. But secondary scenes would be the, the chief of police's house, right? The chief of police's office, the hospital after the shark attacks. And there's lots of little, little secondary settings, if you will, that paint, paint, paint the picture. Right? You need them all to paint the full picture. But again, just like conflict and just like uh, personality traits, there's a primary. What's the primary setting in the monkey's paw? For those of you who read the monkey's paw, anybody? It's in the White House, isn't it? Not the White House, the White Family House. 
Right, that's the primary setting. They talk about a couple of secondary settings, like the guy who brings the monkey's paw talks about, you know, his travels briefly. And then they talk about the son's workplace briefly. Because it's significant, because something happens at that workplace that ties in with the monkey's paw. But the main story takes place in that house. Okay. So your primary setting there would be the White House, the White's house. Okay. And on and on you can go. Pick any book, story, movie, situation, and there's a primary setting. It takes place somewhere. Why? It has to. Is it going to be in limbo out in the air somewhere? Guess what? Air is, air is a setting. So you and that would be have a setting. Okay. Um, so the police ask yourself, does this story have to take place here? Okay. If you think it does, then you can ask the question why, and then you can start digging, and that gives you a nice point of analysis into your story. Okay. The time. Time is huge, guys. It's not just, you know, oh, it's 1028. It's, it's also the era, right? When does it take place in terms of history, okay? Does it take place in the Gothic, like in the Victorian era? Does it take place in the future? The cartoon, The Jetsons, could that take place in the past, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, Victorian era? Probably not. Why? Because it's a future cartoon. What about the Flintstones? Again, that has to take place in that kind of setting. Now, there's an argument that says the Flintstones is actually the future. Because in the theme song, they call them the modern Stone Age family. So they think the Flintstones might be after a nuclear war. I don't think so. I think it's Kate. I don't know how to People who wrote it are probably dead, so we'll know. So that's a fun thing to talk about. So in that case, right, so the setting is the Stone Age. All right. Um, okay. The place, okay, we talked about the geographical location. Where is the action or the main part of the story taking place? It doesn't always, again, it doesn't always have to be significant, right? But there is, at some place in the story, a primary. And if that primary is significant, then you're good to go. The time, okay. when, the historical period, the time of day, the year, et cetera. Time of day, if it's a story about being afraid of the dark, you know, probably your primary setting is going to be at night. Why? Because it's dark can't tell about being afraid of the dark. Well, you can, but you can't illustrate that fear without the dark. And so the dark would be primary. Okay. And that ties into this last one, which we'll get to in a second. What about the weather? Is it rainy, sunny, stormy? Okay. Again, very important, right? Certain things can't be done in the rain. Certain things can't be done in the bright sunshine. Certain things can't be done when it's stormy. Right? So the weather can play a factor so much that it's, it's here as well. We talk about man versus nature, right? If you get wet and you get cold and you, you know, miss something in class, maybe it was for an interview that you missed and you missed a job because of it. So the weather can be significant. Social conditions. What is the daily life of the character's life like? Does the story contain local color? Writing that focuses on speech, dress, manners, and customs of a particular place. Okay. If you've been anywhere else in the country, just our country, never mind the other countries, okay, you know that different regions of the country have different, all of that, right? Local color, they call it. Okay speech, dress, mannerisms, customs. Okay? I'm from Philly. When I first moved down here, the biggest thing I had to get used to was the pace. You guys are a lot slower. 
not in the head. <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, they're, they're, I, I don't notice it now because I've been here 10 years, but at the beginning it was huge, right? In Philly, everybody's rushing around everywhere. It didn't matter what you were doing, you were rushing. That was just the pace. And New York is worse than Philly. But down here, it's a slower pace. And it's a good thing, right? It's more, it's more calm, technically. <laughs> Doesn't have to be, but it tends to be, right? Because you're not like racing to get someplace. So it's got a, a slower pace. The, the local speech, there are some people down here that I still have trouble understanding. I almost don't hear the accent anymore. Almost. My wife still has one. My former dean, I don't know if you know Penny Waddell. She used to be the dean of my department. She had a good accent. Our governor has a good accent. I can, I can understand it, but if I'm not paying attention, I might miss something. Because it's a different, yeah, you go to Philly, you'll hear the accent. You'll hear it in New York, a different one. You'll hear a different one in Boston, the Apocalyptic Hot, okay? You'll hear a different one in Ohio. You'll hear a different one, et cetera, et cetera. Florida's kind of homogenous because a lot of mixed people down in Florida, different places. So I don't know if there is a, a Florida accent, so to no. speak. Gainesville might have, but that's about it. Like you go to Miami, I live there. Yeah. yeah, and so there's not really a specific, like like Gwinnett County, we have a definite accent here. Well, I have to, I have to say this. I lived. You in, don't have to say it. But I want. Okay. <laughs> I lived in L.A., New York, Miami, Gosh. right? Four years in each place and six years in Miami. I've been here in Georgia 20, 26 years, three of which in Gainesville. And I still, till this day, I still get, you're not from here. Right. Where are you from? And I'm like, and a lot of people get, I mean, they, they look at me and they're like, you're from the north. You're from the north. And I'm like, <laughs> not really, but where are you from? And they actually think that I'm from some other well, strange you know some country. Accents. And I'm like, I've been here for 26 years, you know? And, but I, I get a kick out of it, though. I just some think it's funny. Some better than others. Some accents stick more than others. For example, if you have a northern accent, it tends to stick more. Well, for because I lived four years and then I lived six years in Miami, right? And I and I speak Spanish, so I think, and I still speak Spanish, so I think that's where I still keep my traits, you know. But but I remember I was in Gainesville, and I just thought of this right now. I must have been here a year or two, right? And I'll have to say, and I was a lot younger. But Gainesville was like this major culture shock for me, living in other bigger cities and coming straight to Gainesville. And now it's bigger, now it's, you know, it's grown a lot. But, and I'm like, I think I, uh, I was working at a bank and I had this gentleman, his whole entire life here in the South. And I said, good morning, good morning, how can I help you? I don't know what I said, but, and I was a teller. And he says, and I almost took it, I almost felt bad, I almost took it like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. He says to me, you're not from here. You must be a Yankee. And, and I'm like, that's not so good here in the South for you to be a Yankee, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I, I must have been 21, 22 years old. So, but now I don't, I don't it doesn't bother me anymore. Like a term Yankee. They call me a Yankee. We're not, I'm not a Yankee. Cause and I'm like, no. But that's, that's people here. And I love right. Georgia and I learned to love it. This is my home. But in the beginning, I'm like, people think that other people are, I'm not gonna say that we're racist, and I said it, but people here in the beginning, I used to think that people here were stereotypical, you know, and I don't know racist, and, yeah, and I'm it's like. It's not really racist, it's this thing. But, it's this whole local color, that kind of thing. It's not really racist per se. They're just kind of trying to figure out where you're from, right, I mean. Like I said, I love. I come to love Georgia, and I don't. I wouldn't live anywhere else. But be in honest, the beginning, it was a little bit shocking, you know. Where is? The what? What did you say? That I love it here, and that yeah. I wouldn't live anywhere else. You know, I don't. Yeah. I don't care to anymore. You know, this is this is where I'm from. But I, just talking about how I felt like in the beginning. You know, the first couple of years that I lived in Georgia, I'm like, it's supposed to be warm. It's supposed to be friendly. You know, and. 
I don't know. Um, but but now I, I think differently, you know. I, I, just, I love it here. here. The winter down here. Right. Yeah. I know you were talking about warm in a different way, but you said warm in that Oh, the yeah, 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 the, 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 the like weather. And I, like, my first winter here, it went down to like 12 the whole time. And I'm like, where am I? Because uh -huh. yeah, 12 is cold for Philly. Uh -huh. Here I am but here, it's, and it's 12. Well. I'm like, kidding me. But anyway, so that's all part of it, right? That's all part of the local area. Words even, there are certain words people use, pop, soda, cold, coke, right? Used to be down here, when you talked about soda, you just said coke. Mm -hmm. uh, where I'm from, it's soda. Mm -hmm. to, in Ohio and parts Midwest, it's pop. And then there are other areas where it's soda pop and whatever they call it. Um, but that has to do with the local, local culture. It's hard in the United States because you think American, right? And yeah, we're all Americans, and sometimes we forget about that. We're all Americans. But we all have backgrounds, and, and all of the areas in America have backgrounds, too. And if you get into the area, smaller parts of the area have backgrounds. So, you know, you go from macro, which is American, to micro, which is town to town. Okay. Different color, if you will, right? Do they dress differently? And why, right? So down here, the first thing I did, stupidly, was to get rid of all my heavy winter coats. And the guy moved two weeks later, I needed one. Okay. But now, I mean, I think this is weather is more normal now. The winters we've been having is probably more normal for this area now, where you don't really get super cold for a long time. Okay. But, you know, that affects the dress. To Kill a Mockingbird, tying it into literature because we're in English class. To Kill a Mockingbird by Arthur Lee, okay, takes place in a, a fictional town in Alabama called Maycomb, Maycomb Town. And she spends almost the whole exposition okay, talking about the town and the weather. And she drags the, the line, the plot line, the exposition out extra long because she wants the reader to get a feel for what it's like to live in a slow southern town in the middle, middle of summer, okay? It affects you. When it's hot, you can't do certain things comfortably, right? Just like when it's cold, you can't do certain things comfortably. So, again, that's, this is the local color. This is the, the dress, the customs, right? The first time I was riding in, down the street with my wife and a funeral went by and she pulled over and I'm like, what are you doing? Apparently it's a custom down here. Some of you are looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You're probably not from here. Oh, yeah. You have to it's wait. To yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have to wait over until, and show respect. Yeah. yeah, we didn't do that up north. I mean, we still respect it, but we didn't pull over. Now, funerals ran red lights. If you were part of a funeral, you could go through the light. You didn't have to stop because they wanted everybody to stay together, but you didn't have to pull over. But down here, we pulled over. I'm like, what are you doing? And well, I thought, here, I, I realized that they make you, the, the police and everything, they make you stop and help them. Uh, that, that's, I, I've run into that, yeah. and I don't, I don't seem to do it automatically. I do it because You're told there's so. a, no, the, I mean, the, Motorcycle police officers are are stopping the traffic. Mm -hmm. That's what I've gone into. They they stop the they make you stop. It's not like I do it because well I don't know how much respect, of that is courtesy or how much of that is the law. I don't think it's you know, the law. I, I just I just remember several times where oh, you know, I have to wait at a lighter at a stop because there's the um, police uh, officer that there's one like stopping the traffic and yeah, let the yeah, let them pass yeah. by. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's like you have respect. You do have respect, but you they're making you to. That that's what well, I see. And that's an example of something you know? that happens down here that doesn't happen, for example, where I'm from. And I'm sure we had things where I'm from that you didn't have down here. The use of the horn, for example, in the car. <laughs> that's different from place to place. If you've never been to New York, guys, and you plan on going to New York City, the first thing you'll notice is everybody's got their hands on the horn. 
where if you're nervous, don't drive because people are constantly on their horn in that city. And they are a lot where I'm from too, but not nowhere near as much as New York. Now, you know, of course, there's a rivalry between Philly and New York and Philly and Boston, Boston and Philly, blah, blah, blah. So that could also be me a little bit prejudiced in terms of against New York, but I don't think so. A city is a city is a city. You go to a city pretty much anywhere in the country and they have their own personality, right? People who live in Atlanta, and that's another thing that's different. Philly has about 2 million people that live in Philly. But in Atlanta, it's not as, um, it's more of a commute, commuting place than it is a living place. You have some people, but nowhere near as many as in other places. And so when you have people that live in the city, people who live in Atlanta and people who live in Philly and people who live in New York, I mean, city people are city people, no matter where you are, okay? So when you're talking about local color and flavor and culture, you probably can't throw the city in there as much, unless you're talking about the city. Because people in Gwinnett County are different than people in downtown Atlanta. I'm not talking about Fulton County, I'm talking about the city, in, in the city. They're just different. City people are different, because they have to be, I guess. I've lived in the city, it's different. <laughs> It's a different experience. It's fun, depends. Some people hate it, some people love it. But it's different than living in the country, for example. We live in the suburbs. This area right here looks like the area I grew up in in Pennsylvania. The suburbs are the suburbs, just like the city is the city. There's a little more different color from different, you know, local color from there to here. But again, in the, in the whole, the suburb is the suburb. But now you go rural, step out into the country, quote unquote country. That's the rural areas, the places with more than like an acre of land. They have different ways of looking at things as well. Again, you know, it's part of the setting, right? If you're living in a country in a rural situation, things are a little different. Right? Picking up your mail is a trek. Whereas with me, if I walk to the bottom of my driveway and I get my mail. But if I'm in a rural area, I might have to drop to get my mail. I know my buddy lives in the mountains in Pennsylvania, in the Poconos, and he has to drive to put the trash out. Okay. So it's different. Um, but that adds to flavor, the flavor of the story. Right? That adds to the flavor of America. If you want to take the big picture, that's one of the things that makes our country so great. There is no other country in the world that has the, the variety that we have. You go to France, for the most part, people are French. You go to Germany, for the most part, people are German. You know, England's changing a little bit. Ireland, Irish. You don't have a lot of diversity in those countries. But here, we do, and it's amazing. And actually, no matter how much we don't get along sometimes, for political reasons, for racial reasons, for whatever, we're still miles ahead of everybody else. Nobody else is even trying. Okay. So we can kind of pat ourselves on the back for that. And again, it has to do with that. So committed. This is important. Mood or atmosphere. What feelings are created? Now, the word feelings is used here. And it's interesting. And this is what makes language arts kind of special. Because the word feelings implies subjective. Right? It's subjective. Because what you feel is different than what he feels. And what he feels is different than what she feels. And what she feels is different than what she feels. And then, how you express those feelings is different than how he expresses them, which is different than how I express them, right? We all have feelings and emotions. But the extent or level and the expression of those feelings are as varied as, as we as a people are. Okay. Not everybody reacts the same way. Okay. So this, this whole feeling thing is subjective. However, in the case of a short story, okay, if it's significant enough to be used as a point of analysis for what we're talking about, it's going to be obvious. Right? It's not going to be subtle. 
in a lot of cases when you're dealing with people directly in the real life, it can be subtle dealing with feelings. That's why we have such a grand time of getting along. Because it's not always up. Sometimes, especially if you're in a relationship, sometimes you're thinking of feeling a certain way and it's the complete opposite of how your significant other is thinking of feeling. It's hard. It's hard to figure that stuff out. But in our short stories, if this is important, what feeling is created, it's gonna probably whack you over the head with a big stick, okay? For example, a story about a haunted house, okay? The mood or feeling that's created traditionally at the beginning is creepy, isn't it? You know, usually you have this image, for example, of a haunted house. You're not picturing a brand new suburban duplex. You're picturing an old Victorian mansion with the shutters hanging off, you know, and, and it's dark. Maybe there's a storm going on and it's run down. We have a certain image when we say haunted house. Okay? Just like we have a certain image when we say the beach. Some people picture this beach, some people picture that beach, some people picture this, that, and the other. We say the woods. Certain images are subjective, depending on your experience, depends on what you're seeing when I say that. If I say tree and I go around my room, I'm going to get, you know, 25 different descriptions of a tree because we're all not picturing the same tree, right? I'm picturing the Japanese maple that was on my front lawn growing up. It's a great climbing tree, that red leaves, to have dark red leaves. It was a great climbing tree, all the branches were perfect my friend fell and broke his arm <laughs> and there was no more climb. That's what I picture and you might picture something, do picture something completely different. Why? Because you didn't grow up in my house with that tree out front. It's subjective. Okay. But when we're telling stories, particularly in novel or short stories, and then the equivalent in Hollywood movies, okay, they gotta be a little more obvious about it if that's significant. Right? They want you to have the feeling, the mood. Now, there are opposites, right? Sometimes they do the opposite because the traditional is so played out that it doesn't have the desired effect anymore. What do I mean? Well, the horror story that takes place, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon in a new suburban duplex. Why does that work? Well, because it's shocking. It's a surprise. You don't expect it. When you hear haunted house, you have this image in your head. And now the author's taking you on a different spin. Okay? So it's an old idea in a new way, if you will. And that works too sometimes. It's done correctly. Okay? So what is the feeling created at the beginning of the story? Is it bright and cheerful or is it dark and frightening? Using the monkey's paw example, when you're in that living room with the whites, okay, it's a very kind of pensive, heavy atmosphere, just by the description, okay. Um, and furthermore, when you take a, a story and put it in a movie, now you have the choreography, the or, or yeah, that too, but you have the, the score, the the music, okay, and certain musics make you feel a certain way. Movie Jaws, that two note bass thing. If nobody who's ever seen Jaws will ever hear that in anything else. Right. Star Wars, that majestic music. Same thing. Harry Potter, Hedwig's theme. You'll never hear that any other way. So that's part, that has become part of the setting. Okay. The idea of the music. Okay. So where is this established? Well we said when we were talking about the elements of plot and we were into the exposition, we said the exposition is where the author exposes us to the setting and the characters. So generally speaking it's introduced in the beginning because it's usually important enough for, for no other reason than a place to put the characters that the author tells you pretty much right away, okay? And they don't always say, 
you know, it depends on the genre. If you use noir literature, uh, crime noir, where it's like a very blunt, they might say, it was a dark, stormy night. The room was cold. Blah, blah, blah. They might describe it like that, which is obvious stuff. But in most cases, it's a little bit more subtle than that. They won't tell you it's a dark, stormy night. They'll show you by what the characters are doing and how the characters are reacting. She did shudder as lightning flashed across the sky. Well, I'm not telling you there's a storm. I'm telling you she didn't shudder because of lightning, which implies, obviously, that there's a storm. Okay. So right in the beginning, okay. The time and place are a series of times and places. That's where we said there's a primary setting and secondary settings as well. Most stories have more than one setting, guys. Okay. Not all, but most. Right. Think of your favorite movie or book. There's lots of little settings throughout. I said in Jaws, right? The main setting is the end when they're on the boat. But there's lots of little other settings as well that are important, but they're not central to the story per se. Okay. will be established as naturally as if you were looking around and taking it in for yourself. Okay. And this is key. These elements are exposed to you just as they would be exposed if you were to wake up in that situation yourself. You open your eyes, what do you see? And remember, you have more than a couple of senses, you have lots, right? What do you see? What do you, what do you smell? What do you hear? You got a funny taste in your mouth? Okay. Um, you know, are you feeling something weird with your hands? Maybe it's dark and you feel something weird. That's a nice way that author uses it to build suspense as well. Okay. If you smell bacon cooking, it gives you a homey feel. If you smell smoke, it gives you a panicky feel. If you smell, you know, whatever, Exhaust, car exhaust, it gives you a panicky feeling. Senses can, can lead to a lot of exposition and, and they're used very well. Okay. All right. Pretty much tells you what we just went through. Okay. That's what I just said. Hey, you have five senses, so it's not just what you see, how do things look? What does it? What does? It, what do you? What does? What you see tell you about the setting? What can you hear? How do the sounds tell you about the setting? How do things feel? Is it cold? Is it hot? How does it smell? Do you taste anything? What do they tell about the setting? Okay. So a lot of things can be gleaned from the five senses, guys. And we have other senses as well. For example, that feeling that you're being watched. That's a very primitive, hardwired thing. That's a real thing. And not every time you feel that way do you, are you actually being watched. However, it came from um, survival, survival instinct, right? Chances are, back in the day, if you felt like you were being watched, you probably were. You were probably been hunted and so forth. Okay, so um, pay attention to the senses in your story. What is the mood of this? Is it depressing? Is it eerie? Is it frightening? Is it happy? Is it sunny? That kind of thing. Pay attention to that as well. Right? Past, present, future, time of day. Is it important? Can a story take place in the morning? Does it have to take place in the afternoon? Or maybe it has to take place in the middle of the night? Usually, depending on the genre of the story, it'll tell you not all the time, right? But most of the time, it'll tell you where and when it's taken place. What is the space? That's important too. Is it taking place in a single room? And why? Or is it taking place in multiple rooms in a house? Or maybe it's taking place in multiple houses in the neighborhood. Or maybe it's taking place in multiple, maybe you get the idea. Okay. What is the size and why? Why is that important? If, for example, you're, you're reading a book, The Shawshank Redemption, the movie, the book is called Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. It's in the novella. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you remember Shawshank Redemption, one of the main settings there is a jail cell. So it's 10 by 12. 
Is it important? Yes, it is. Why? Because he's in jail. And that's where he's digging a hole to get out. That, so the space becomes important. Could he have done it in a bigger cell? Probably not, because it would have had more attention to it. But because it was a small, regular cell down the end of the block, he was able to do things he wasn't able to do in a big place. Okay. And then is there more than one setting? And if there is, ask yourself the same questions and see have more than one primary or you just have the one primary. Usually you'll just have the one primary. Okay. All right. Now this worksheet is very interesting, guys. And this is a very nice brainstorm for what you're doing. All right. If you choose to use setting as a point of analysis, okay, this is a nice chart to print out and fill out. It'll take you two minutes, but it'll help you focus your thoughts. So let's look at this really quickly, okay? I'm just going to do an example, but we don't have the time. Okay. So questions to ask. What is the setting? What is the historical period? We're in historical period now, right? We're in the modern period. I think it's the computer that we still have. I'm not sure. Right. We, we, we used to be in the space age. Probably more in the cell phone industry. There's probably an official title for it, but who knows? What country or lo of locale, season of the year, weather, time of day, what are the sight, sound, smell, taste, what other details establish a sense of place? And then what it asks you to do is jot down evidence from the story. Okay? And the idea is remember, this is a brainstorm, sort of. It's a free brain. Number two, are the characters in conflict with the setting? Yes, you're doing setting. However, one of the things, the reasons why setting is important is because when the characters enter into conflict, just like Maslow with the motivation, sometimes the setting is important as well. You know, you came into my room, you're not allowed in my room. What are you doing in my room? Okay. Characters getting in conflict about the setting. What do the characters want? Does the setting keep them from getting what they want? Right. Number three, what does the setting tell us about the characters? What feelings or attitudes do the characters reveal toward the setting? Are they afraid? Do they feel pleasure? Are they challenged? Do they dislike it? Do they respect it? Other feelings or attitudes. Right. How would you describe the atmosphere or mood created by the setting? Cheerful, mysterious, threatening, other. Okay. Can be a very integral part of the story. Okay. You have to ask yourself the question what effect does it have on the story? Is it effective enough to the point where you can do it as part of the town? Okay. Does, it, does the setting affect the outcome? Anyway, that's what you choose that. That can be a very big point of analysis to use, guys, if you so choose. What? How do you get there? Yeah. How do you get there here where I can look to those? Oh, okay, I'll show you in a second. 